Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll be uh, getting started in a couple of minutes. We're just sorting out the presentations. Okay, okay so Mar's going to go first. Yeah, but you're going to introduce sure. it. First. Yeah. So hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us here at the Football Leaks and Panama Papers uh, panel. Um, so Football Leaks and the Panama Papers are two journalism projects that uh, have essentially, I think anyway, redefined collaboration, especially on a European and global scale around investigative reporting. So we're going to take the opportunity here with this chat to talk to, to two of these pioneers, two of the the important people behind two of these great projects. We're, we're going to structure it pretty informally, and I want to make sure I leave time for everyone's questions. But um, we're going to have two presentations, and then we'll really deep dive. We're going to lift the lid on the processes, uh, on the people behind uh, some, of these, some of these projects. So um, first of all, I will just introduce uh, the people here to my left. So Mark Abra is the head of uh, the Data and Research Unit at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, also known as the ICIJ, which is the organization behind the Panama Papers. And then Stefan Candea, uh, one more over to the left, is the co-founder and coordinator of uh, the European Investigative Collaborations, that's EIC, um, and they're behind Football Leaks. Um, so I'm going to throw the floor over to them to basically do the in-depth stuff on their own projects, and then we're going to have a bit of a chat. So Mar's going to kick us off with uh, the Panama Papers introduction. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very small, so I hope you can see me behind this. Um, this presentation, if you want to follow it, save it, or whatever, it's the link is there. It's a bit.ly uh, link, forward slash PP for Panama Papers, Perugia. So uh, you can reuse the slides if you want. I'm here to talk about this project that was at the time the largest leak in journalism history and the largest collaboration in journalism history. The Panama Papers, it's an investigation uh, that launched and published almost a year ago, April 3rd last year. So we are just turning one year anniversary after we published. The revolution will be digitized is what the source of the Panama Papers said. He wrote a manifesto that you can read online that said that he gave this data, he or she actually, we don't know who he or she is, um, gave this data to, to journalists so that we could expose this unjust system, which is the offshore economy, to the public. This source, John Doe, John Doe, for those of you who are not native English speakers, is just a random name for anybody. Um, John Doe uh, contacted several media organizations, contacted WikiLeaks, and among those media organizations contacted a journalist at Süddeutsche Zeitung, a German newspaper based out of Munich. Uh, it's pretty big in Germany, but you know, pretty small for the rest of the world because you know they write in German. Uh, but you know, he or she contacted um, this guy, Bastian Obermeier, who was at the time with his family, who was sick, taking care of his fat kids, taking care of his wife, and got this message saying, hello, are you interested in data? And I'm sure this is a room full of journalists. If I ask you, hello, are you interested in data? What, what would be the answer? Yes. Right, pretty obvious. Well, not that obvious because um, some other media organizations didn't reply yes and WikiLeaks didn't reply yes. So that's the main reason why a reporter, random reporter out of Germany, uh, got the um, biggest leak in journalism history to date. Of course, his response was yes, um, and that's what led to the Panama Papers, which, as you can see here in this in this graph, compares to the previous investigations. We're not comparing in size with investigations afterwards, so I don't have the graphic done for com comparison in size with, uh, with with football leaks. But as you can see, at the time was a big challenge in terms of data processing and, um, and analysis. Uh, I am the head of the team at the ICIJ and got tasked with this um, almost you know, a year and a half ago already. And of course, it, it meant a big challenge. But luckily, we had worked on projects based on leaks before, those some, most of those in the left. And even though they were smaller, we had actually experimented with technology enough so that we had a baseline to know where to start when, when we got this leak. 
Uh, this is what we were dealing with. Uh, we're dealing with a complex system, uh, information for about 40 years of a Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca, uh, based out of Panama, but with offices in 40 countries in the world, and connections with clients in more than 200 countries in the world. The leak was received by Su Deutsche Zeitung, um, but they immediately thought that, in their own words, the most selfish thing to do was to share. Because they thought, okay, we could have four or five front pages in Germany. You know, that's going to work well with my bosses. They could probably, probably they even could have gotten a raise. But we really, they really wanted to do justice to this. And they felt that they didn't have enough knowledge about what was happening in Spain, what was happening in Brazil, what was happening in Uganda to be able to tackle this uh, um, by themselves. So they thought the most selfish thing to do is to actually distribute their responsibility among reporters all around the world. And they came to ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the media company I work for, so that we actually created this team around the world um, to work together. The ICIJ is a very small organization. We just uh, became independent. We spinned off from our parent organization for 20 years. And we are really small. People think we're like this multi-million dollar operation with hundreds of people. No, it's the people in the photo um, that is the ICIJ. Those with a circle are the people in my team. So as you can see, the people um, that work in data and research, data and technology, have a high importance in uh, the uh, the formation of the ICIJ today. Three years ago, my team did not exist. What we did was to share um, the data with more than 370 journalists in 80 countries and formed this global newsroom that looked at the data in secret for a year. As you can see from some of the logos here, we had big media organizations like Le Monde, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, in Italy, we worked with L'Espresso. But there are also small organizations from different you know, countries and developing countries, smaller organizations that are non-for-profit. So we work with a range, wide range of reporters. Mostly we work, as a general rule, we work with one org media organization per country because the exclusivity to the data is what actually moves them to invest resources. Media organizations like The Guardian had five, people to say five six people for a year fully dedicated to this so they were motivated by I will have the exclusivity however uh, what we're trying to do is more collaborations between print and television so for example in Spain we worked with um, a newspaper called El Confidencial and we worked with the television and that worked like a good um, a duo we're also trying experimental things. You know, we actually, in Peru, worked with three small nonprofit organizations that worked together on the same project and got them to collaborate. Or in Venezuela, where freedom of expression is at a great risk, it was a team of a dozen reporters joining forces from different media organizations to work together and get shielded by this collaborative work to be able to, to, to do work in, a, in an independent way. We all publish together. That's also uh, the rule of thumb. And we use technology to, uh, to try to make this collaboration happen across borders. There are two main um, technological tools that we use that we've um, adapted from open source software. One is a place to talk to each other, a virtual newsroom. Uh, we call it the global iHub. It's the image you see in the left. Uh, and then once we get everybody talking to each other and sharing leads and, and building on each other's knowledge, uh, what we do is also give access to everybody to all the data in what we call a radical sharing methodology. And we have our own document search platform where anybody in the team could search any time from anywhere in the world and download the documents and, and make the research by themselves. We publish all together. We published, started publishing in April 3rd. In some countries, the publication lasted six weeks in a row. But the main impact is that we all publish together this secret at the same time so that it becomes news all around the world and trending topic too. What we exposed, I hope you know what we exposed. Um, I hope you know about the Panama Papers and I'm looking forward to actually the conversation more than, uh, than, than me talking about, about you know, the investigation in itself, conversation of how we did things, because collaboration is something that I'm sure you are doing, and if not, you're going to be doing soon. Um, but the main thing what we did with the Panama Papers was put a spotlight on a system that has a high importance in our economy, which is offshore 
economy, the offshore world has a high importance because it allows the rich and the powerful to hide in an opaque system and have a parallel economy that allows these people to not pay taxes, to um, do business without being able to be scrutinized. And that has a great impact in no taxes, no public services. It also has a great impact in the inequality and the growing inequality that we're seeing in our societies. So what we do at ICIJ, we do reporting, we facilitate collaboration, we do technology, we also do reporting and have a global story or several global stories. This was actually our main story that we shared with all the partners, which is kind of like the uh, greatest hits of the investigation because we basically pull all the best leads together and have a like one story that looks at the issue from a global perspective. One of the main findings was also the high importance and of how politicians, how many politicians were actually using this offshore economy. We accounted for at least 140 politicians in more than 50 countries. Some of them, around a dozen, were heads of state or government, current or in the past. So for example, the Prime Minister of Iceland had a connection to an offshore company that he had not declared. The current President of Argentina, Macri, had a connection with an offshore company that he had not declared either when he was the major of Buenos Aires and so on. So those politicians, we not only tell stories through words, we tell stories through visual means. We actually did this interactive that showed some of those names that I was talking to you about. And we also share that with our reporters. So actually, this interactive was embedded in the media organization's websites. Now, uh, the data helped us prove things that had been talked about, but without much evidence because the offshore economy and tax havens are opaque. The data allowed us to, to show, this is a graphic of, of how the registrations in corporations of companies worked um, through this law firm in these almost 20, 21 jurisdictions that they worked on and uh, over, you know, over time. And we started seeing, we used the data also to find, you know, what's the story. So, so we started seeing things like this. If you look closely at the, this area circled with the red, um, you see Niue around 2004 starts going down. Niue is an island in the Pacific um, that was a big tax haven at the time. And then you see that other lines are starting to go up, right? So you would see that Samoa and Seychelles start to go up. And of course, I cannot say, you know, there's correlation here between one thing or the other, but we use these data to guide us how to shift through the documents. And when we shifted through the documents, we were able actually to see emails from Mossack Fonseca saying, dear clients, we're closing the Niue registry, but don't worry. If you go to Samoa, we do free redomiciliation. Or if you pay a little extra, you can also go to Seychelles. So actually, we're able to show how, as long as tax havens exist, closing what loophole does not work. Because if there's another loophole, they will move there um, uh, because you know banks and enablers um, know a lot on how to advi advise their clients. So actually, the enablers were a big part of the investigation. We looked at how banks and law firms enabled the system. More than 500 banks asking for um, offshore companies to Mossack Fonseca. And once we published, and by publishing all together, we got the whole world's attention, right? Some people were not happy. Uh, but um, jokes aside, the reality is we were able to have great impact around the world. These are the streets of Iceland the day after we published, asking for the resignation of their prime minister, who, by the way, resigned. A minister in Spain also resigned for lying uh, about his connections to offshore companies. There are investigations right now, like the investigation happening at the European Union level. And we did a, a, a recollection of the impact of the investigation eight months into the project, so by the end of last year. And those are some of the numbers that we came up with. And I have to tell you, those are this is a complete underestimation. An underestimation because it's based on survey responses and not all our partners responded, but we're talking about at least 150 investigations opened in 79 countries. More than 6,500 people and companies investigated. More than 4,700 stories published by ICIG and its media partners. I think that these impressive numbers are probably 
unique in journalism. And we were able to achieve that because we collaborated with each other, something which wasn't uh, thought of before. We also were able to actually get the public to help us investigate by publishing some of the data. We couldn't publish the whole leak because of privacy and security reasons, and I'm more than happy to talk about that later in the, um, in the uh, discussion. But we were able to publish the information of those companies in tax havens and the people behind them in this database, the Offshore Leaks database, that today uh, includes around half a million companies in tax havens whose information you cannot get elsewhere because tax havens don't have open corporate registries. And here, thanks to this database, you can find anybody. You can find public figures like Emma Watson, the actress who was using a company in British Virgin Islands to buy a, a, a property, um, to be the owner of a property in London, according to her, because she didn't want the people to know where she lived. But the problem with tax havens is that you find Emma Watson, and at the same time, you find Rami Mahlouf connected to the Assad family and helping blacklisted uh, for um, helping the war in Syria and blacklisted for supposedly not being a right person to do business with. But of course, if he does business in an opaque system, he can get away with whatever he wants. So that's, that's the problem with, with tax havens. A few thoughts for discussion uh, and that I've been thinking about in this past year. I think that this is the best panel to talk about this, about how electronic leaks and massive electronic leaks are the new normal in journalism. I'm not saying it's the only thing. I'm not saying investigative journalism should all be about leaks. But the reality is that technology is allowing us to receive bigger and bigger leaks. Um, and that, that's the way it's going to go. And we were the largest collaboration, in journal, largest leak in journalism history. Then, you know, that, you know, probably that's th that, um, is going to be, you know, overcome soon. I think that global collaboration can help with this new uh, uh, situation that we have to deal with. And data journalism is very, very helpful to actually um, deal with this massive amount of information. Some other thoughts. Um, this is the um, John Doe manifesto that I was referencing at the beginning. Whistleblowers are of great help. For that, they need to be protected. There's very little protection uh, in our countries for people that want to leak information securely. We need to do more in journalism also to facilitate uh, how whistleblowers can leak to us information securely. And one last thought is we need to make this journalism sustainable. And that's why in ICIJ we have just launched a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, even though we get foundation support and it's very important, and you may have heard that Omidia Network just announced a up to 4.5 million investment in ICIJ for the next three years, which is great. And we're very grateful for their support along with our other funders. We really believe that it's the public, it's people like you that can help us uh, make ICIJ sustainable sustainable in the future. So this one small request, if all of you, not now, whenever you have time, could actually help us promote this campaign and at least send a tweet, which doesn't cost money, that would be very, very helpful. Of course, if you want to donate, that's the URL and we'd be grateful for your support too. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ma. So they, there you get a real glimpse of the scale of the investigation and also the, the political impact that that kind of work had. Stefan, it's a different industry in a way, but it's going to present us uh, uh, another investigative project with, with basically similar scale and also similar impact, football leaks. Sorry, uh, hi. Sorry, I'm trying to make this thing work. It's in Italian. Oh, Jesus. Just a second. I need to ask the tech guy to put a full view on it. Hey, um, so uh, I have a small technical problem with my uh, with my presentation format. What was the full view here? Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Looks ridiculous because I intended to do it landscape, but it works. Uh, it's, it's solved, thanks. So I'm Stefan Kande. I'm um, working in uh, journalism for about 15 years, doing mostly cross-border stories on investigative journalism, organized crime from uh, Romania. 
and the co-founder of the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism and a member also of ICAJ. Um, in 2015, at the end of 2015, I started discussing with Der Spiegel in Germany um, the need to have a European uh, network to do investigative journalism. And uh, during 2016, we started testing this idea with uh, a few media partners that have very different backgrounds and very different shapes from large ones to very small ones. Um, and we started with a, with a small uh, project to see how we collaborate together and what tools do we need and so on. Um, and during our uh, investigation, one of the journalists at Spiegel, uh, Raphael Buschmann, came with a huge leak uh, that uh, it's called football leaks. And I will go through how we worked in, in football leaks to understand a bit on how we uh, try to approach this network, uh, uh, network cross-border investigative journalism. Um, in a way, it's, uh, it's different. Uh, it, there is no um, structure or organization uh, in the middle. The partners are forming the, 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 the workforce, and that there is a distribution in what is done by each partner, not only on research, but also an investigation, but also in information design tools, uh, development, um, and so on. So actually, it's a more informal group, um, and uh, this is the group will, will grow following this structure, and it's not a new organization that will uh, be in the middle of all these uh, media partners. So I, I have about, like four points uh, to make um, related to the network uh, process that we, we followed. And it starts, everything starts before uh, even the idea of an uh, investigation. Um, with the network available and with the tools available for, for, for the group. And they are going, when the, when the idea is very clear, they are going to, to be changed, scrapped, or developed uh, better. Then there is this uh, publication period when you have most of the tensions in the network because they relate to, uh, they, they kind of bring to light all the differences in the, in the partners, in their uh, culture of understanding journalism, in their, their way of understanding their role in their society and the way they, they do stories. And this is um, one of the main tensions. The second big one is the embargoes and when people publish. Um, and I think the, there was much more effort into uh, trying to mitigate this um, uh, very tension discussions um, about the publication dates. It was much more effort into that than the whole year of, uh, of research. And at the very end, I will talk a bit about uh, how I see this uh, uh, cross-border investigative journalism networks developing and what I see that the, the trends are and where I should be, um, where, where journalists should be looking at when they join such, such a, a network. And I can speak now from both ends. Uh, I have experience as being part of different uh, smaller or larger investigative projects. I was part of the core team in Offshore Leaks with ICAJ uh, in 2013. To, but I was a user, basically. I was a journalist participating in it. Now with this one, with the Football Leaks, I was on the other end uh, coordinating it. So I understand now more the, the, um, the pressure uh, on, the, on the people who are uh, coordinating such a project. So what was uh, available when Football Leaks came to us, um, it was uh, 12 media already uh, in Ike uh, signing a letter of understanding and saying we will participate in um, investigative projects together, and each media will assign some journalists, depending on how big they are, uh, to stories. Um, <clears throat> we already had a story published. It's called The Weapons of Terror. We looked at how uh, weapons at uh, uh, the terrorist attack in Paris end up in France, and where they come from, and what was their, uh, what was the legal um, loops uh, in the European legislation used to make that type of business um, uh, possible. We had some tools already developed for, for, from uh, different projects before, but we didn't have our own stack of tools. We didn't have like a bundle of things that would deal with the uh, indexing and search, that would deal with a communication platform, with information exchange and stuff like that. We used uh, at the very beginning a platform called Intertwinkles. Unfortunately, it's not developed anymore because it was easy to uh, for the participants to create um, to create uh, uh, pad, 
pa pages where everybody could collaborate in the um, uh, process of uh, in exchanging information. We had a tool called Hoover at the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism already de uh, uh, developed as a free software, open source, to uh, deal with the different collections of data, data that the journalists uh, at the center had and to make it easy for everybody to index them, upload their collections, index them, and decide who in the network, in the Romanian center network, uh, would have access to this collection. So we had something to, to start with. Um, the European investigative collaborations, maybe you didn't hear about it until now. Um, I, had, I should have started with this. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's only about investigating uh, European topics and doing a very focused job on Europe and see what topics are relevant for different communities, how they are affected by power structures, be it governments, uh, politicians, companies, religious organizations, and so on. And here you have all the pre present partners. We are gaining a few more partners uh, after football leagues, but we don't intend to become like a huge thing because we really have, uh, you will see that from the process description, we really have uh, the need to be able to know each other and talk face to face. And uh, uh, when you have uh, hundreds of people, you, you, you can't do that anymore. We rather uh, have a smaller groups of people working in parallel on different projects and um, synchronizing each other uh, from time to time. As I told you, the Football Leaks uh, project came um, because uh, Raphael Buschmann from Spiegel insisted um, uh, to get in contact with the source of a platform that was uh, called Football Leaks, a person who was publishing documents from inside uh, the football industry. And um, Raphael Buschmann convinced that person uh, to hand him the, all the data that person had. Uh, it was a huge um, salad of different things. Uh, it was uh, emails, it was um, PDFs, it was uh, documents, um, it was even WhatsApp uh, conversation. It was uh, encrypted emails, uh, but encrypted in form of Hashmail emails with the keys included, so we could, we could read it. Um, it was um, a, a, a big, um, it had like different sources, so it was not possible for us to build an organized database. It was not about companies, it was about communication between different people um, who have a big role in the football industry. Um, and the whole thing was uh, almost two terabytes. Um, it was huge uh, for, uh, it was huge to deal with, especially because of the fact that uh, it had no structure. And we published uh, the football leaks, but this is only a part of what the data contains. And it, there are other uh, stuff in the data that have no relationship to, to football. And uh, you will uh, hear from Ike um, different uh, projects during this year based on this data. The journalists who start working on it uh, come from 12 countries and they all had uh, access to the data in a way or another. They decided how they um, will look at the data. Basically, we decided at the very beginning that we share the, the whole data set with everybody in the network. So every partner, every media partner had a way to get access to the raw data. But also we cleaned the data and we indexed the data in the Hoover tool that I mentioned before. And you will, uh, Hoover already developed um, a lot during the, the project. You'll you'll find it on GitHub if you uh, if you are interested about it, um, and you can you can use it or you can participate in further developing it. It's um, about roughly 100 people uh, who are using it on a daily basis, and. Um, we try to improve different um, uh, features on the search uh, tool, but mainly we want to keep it a simple, uh, uh, simple and robust search tool. We use uh, we used in football leagues a few other tools, and these are very important, I think, uh, because we had no um, uh, bundle of tools that would solve everything that we need to do. We decided, and this is kind of my uh, idea of looking at investigative journalism, to, to be really modular. And instead of having the Swiss knife that does everything, uh, to have the bits uh, of, uh, of modules that solve the different needs and put them together. So we found it uh, in, a way, uh, in, in a way that it's called uh, Sandstorm. 
It's a platform um, that you can run your own instance. It's a free software uh, uh, platform um, that you can run uh, as your own instance. You can put layers of security on top of it. And inside that platform, you can run already existing applications that everybody knows and that have communities of developers uh, behind them. First of all, Rocket Chat, which is a, uh, the free software version of Slack. Um, it is a way to, you, there, there are ways to synchronize Rocket Chat with any other communication tools like uh, Atlassian tools, uh, Slack tools. There are bridges to different other uh, tools. We use, uh, second, the Etherpad because that is a way to open a, a page and a whole group of 20 or 30 people working on it collaborate on it. And it was amazing to see a group of uh, 40 people fighting about when to uh, start talking to different, to confront different people for the articles. Um, and when everybody was shown the pad, um, in like, I think two hours, the discussion was solved to uh, confront maybe 300 uh, different peoples and institutions. So, because everybody could put uh, in real time their own, uh, their own input on it. Uh, we use um, a thing called Davros, which is uh, it's similar to Dropbox, um, so people can share files. And uh, uh, a management uh, tool called uh, We Can. You see the links here. Uh, and we share findings in in the in GitLab instance, where people, when they find something, they 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 uh, give the URL of the finding in the uh, search tool, and they put place a finding in the in the GitLab. And then let other people know in the chat. And we, f we use DocWiki to create wikis, which is the, uh, the most used uh, applications. Well, for Football Leaks, I think the group of uh, almost 60, 70 people who participated, they created more than 500 wiki pages. Um, because we use the wiki pages for uh, filing uh, information, raw information, but we use the wiki pages also to um, keep track on who confronted who, what the replies are coming. And we use the DocuWiki system to uh, post drafts. Um, one important thing is that during the project and the work of Ike, it, there is no um, uh, there is no centralized package of articles that would go to every everybody in the network. So every media partner does his own article, and then they exchange the draft in the local language and with some bullet points um, in English, or they translate their draft in English for others in the network to see and to use whatever they want to use from their story. So basically, it's, um, it's a puzzle that it's put together for different, uh, for, by different journalists for different audiences in different languages. Um, that also solves a huge issue that we don't need to have a central editor who will, who will centralize all the confrontation and the copies and will have the responsibility, also the legal responsibility, to, to publish in one place. So that's or that's the workflow. People uh, people scratch this this uh, search tool uh, for hours and hours every day. They find something, they make a note in the finding system, they let people know in the chat, and then they create uh, wiki pages. We try to make this system um, easier, and we start to uh, play with uh, integrating annotations um, and but annotations um, annotations as an extra layer. Uh, on top of the uh, source documents, so we can, um, so we can, uh, uh, so we can work directly on the documents instead of using different other venues to post the findings. Uh, annotations that we use, we use hypotheses. Uh, they have uh, a great uh, thing that they remain there. So if anybody else in the team comes on the same document, we'll see that the, the document was useful for someone in in the group. Um, I think by the way, by the moment that uh, the stories are drafted, everything uh, went smooth and fine. Um, in the moment then that we had drafts and we had to start the confrontation, that there was a little war uh, erupting, and that was because people have totally different understanding how the confrontation should work. Some want to talk to pe to, to people to ask them about uh, what they did and to meet with them. Some want to call them. Some want or need to have only written um, uh, conversation, um, only per email, and only with like in a in a specific time frame, and they don't take like uh, they don't they cannot take 
any information from the partners if it's not collected like this for legal reasons. Um, also, some of the journalists in the group are used uh, more the southern part of Europe um, are used to just chat about this with with the uh, with the people they want to confront, and to not tell them what they have. <laughs> Uh, some people in, in the more western, northern part of Europe want to send a very detailed uh, inquiry in the emails, basically outlining what they have. And when they do that, of course, you are um, risking uh, huge exposure because that person can uh, further use your material to attack you in court, but also to um, outscoop you using other uh, newspapers, maybe. or. Uh, kill your story by attacking your story in different ways in different newspapers. So it's a, it's a huge, uh, this was a huge debate on how to do it and in what language to send the, the, the confrontation questions because, for instance, if you collect conf uh, information for one partner in Germany but you do it in Spain or Romania, it's very awkward to send to your uh, local people the questions in English. Um, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, but it makes sense because of legal uh, reasons that you do that and you wait for an answer in English. So this came as a, as a big unexpected uh, surprise in terms of um, uh, how much energy and passion was put in the debate. Then the second thing that was problematic was the injunction, well, was the, the injunction system in, in Europe. We got in um, Spain an injunction against El Mundo, but also the judge injuncted all the partners to use any material and publish anything about the data. We ignored that. Uh, we got an injunction in uh, Great Britain that was coming in the middle of the publication um, and Sunday Times had to respect that injunction even until this uh, January or February when we, when we published the stories and British media took the stories from European partners and published them in the UK because they didn't know that there was an injunction in effect. <clears throat> but at the end, uh, sometimes couldn't publish uh, on that story at all. I have one minute? Okay. Um, then there was some injunction in um, uh, Germany. And uh, I think that's being still processed in court. And I think uh, another interesting aspect of our collaboration is that we not only have now three parallel levels of research, information design, and technology being developed in this network, but we, um, we got to have the fourth uh, level of collaboration between the lawyers of all these media, uh, which the lawyers were very specialized in their own country and they were looking very, very clear at uh, their uh, environment, so not very, didn't care much about what's the legislation in the, the other countries or what is the legislation at the European level because it's a, it's a very long process to, uh, to wait for, for a court trial to uh, be brought up in, a, in the European court. But I think it's a start and the, 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 the lawyers talk about this, it's very important because what we are seeing, it's a backlash against leaks and it's uh, the way the injunctions were formulated in Spain, Germany and uh, the UK would make uh, impossible the reporting on any leak in the future if you would respect what they say. If they say that stolen uh, personal material like this cannot be used. They also mentioned the uh, confidentiality, the privilege of lawyer uh, client because some of the emails we were looking at were uh, conversations uh, of lawyers. This is a, this is a very uh, tricky, uh, tricky field. And there was a lot of courage, I think, from uh, El Mundo to decide to ignore the injunction in their own country. Um, and each partner decides differently, decides differently in how to, uh, how to deal with this. Um, I think really that you cannot stop uh, the information to be published uh, by way of injunction, but you can really harm a media uh, organization uh, specifically who invested a lot of time and money to research something because they would not be able to publish themselves. Um, and also for this reason, we, we have a partner outside the European Union uh, in Serbia. So, Basically, it's kind of uh, impossible to stop all the members to publish something. And the last one is the embargoes on the publication date, which was the other main uh, point of tension. Uh, it is not considered anymore that uh, if you publish in French and German, you are not competing. Uh, people are very keen to have the same embargo on the same story. Now we have uh, the news wires who are watching the, the uh, big media in each of these uh, uh, countries, 
So whatever you publish in French will end up uh, on the Newswire feed in 20 minutes after, and then it will be credited to the news agency. So basically that was a big um, point of, of discussion, and we've seen it, how it works, how you can by mistake uh, break a story of a colleague, um, and that becomes uh, viral, and it's not uh, helping uh, that specific outlet um, to, bring, uh, to, to get the notoriety through this. I think these, are the, these were the main tension points I want to say. But on the bright side, I think um, after the, the publication was over, um, not only that, uh, of course, you have um, a lot of things happening in the background now on, in terms of what authorities do about it, uh, you have uh, a stronger uh, uh, network of journalists. We meet every uh, week for an hour online. And so after a year of doing this, you get to know people very well and you get to trust them. And of course, out of this collaboration starts a number of other collaborations, smaller or bigger, on a lot of other topics and uh, new ideas come to light. We also meet every three or four months um, face to face. And we do that by visiting each other newsrooms. So also um, people can see uh, how the journalists work in that respective country. Um, it is possible with... Uh, the bigger newsrooms to do that. It would be impossible with the Romanian center, I guess. That would be the bedroom of one of my colleagues to visit. Um, but um, it, it, we went to Belgrade, for instance, and that was very informative for the, for the journalists visiting because they kind of, uh, they were not up to date on what exactly it's like to be a journalist in Serbia right now with this uh, current prime minister. And the last one uh, I want to show is a sort of um, interesting side effect, not I don't count it uh, necessarily as an impact. We've seen, this is a page uh, of a novel, a police novel, that was published this year, and uh, that is uh, just fiction. But the journalist has uh, read uh, about how we work, so he integrated in the novel, um, the, the writer, sorry, integrated in the novel because it's about investigative journalists, integrated the name of Ike and uh, Spiegel and Le Soir and Alain, whatever, and my name. So he wanted to make it real, and so Ike made it into a pulp fiction novel. Anyway, um, it, there is more if you want to read about uh, all the stories that were published uh, in, in, the, in, the, in December and January uh, on this topic, and you will see it on the Ike uh, website. Um, there are a few points that maybe would be uh, for discussion, because um, I'm really interesting, interested um, about this uh, phenomenon of growing networks and how these networks start because of these collaborations and investigations. You are kind of pushed to uh, uh, create investigative platforms. And once you create investigative platforms, you are either following what the other platforms are doing, and you hear before a panel discussion about what big platforms like Google and Facebook do, or what, what it's uh, sort of uh, worrying about uh, the power of such platforms. I guess we are witnessing uh, a phenomenon in investigative journalists, and these platforms become more common because there is no way you cannot uh, collaborate. But there is a way to sort of um, construct your platforms in, uh, in a uh, good way, and I think there needs to be a lot of discussion on that. There is um, the perspective of the user, the journalist. There is the perspective of the, the owner of the platform, um, which could be an organization or could be a cooperative. Uh, but anything you do on that platform as a user, uh, you should be aware of it. And for instance, we decided very early on when we built uh, our Hoover search tool um, that we will not keep, we'll keep minimum uh, information on the users. So users entering the system and exiting, we know that but we don't know what the user does. We don't know what the user searches. Uh, we, we don't know that for many reasons. And one is also that the platforms can be attacked by outsiders, and uh, maybe we're not that good at protecting the platform. And the, then we expose uh, the whole history of search of the journalists. So I think this kind of, um, this kind of uh, stuff I wanted to bring for discussion, I will just close this. Oh. We're actually almost out of time, so I'm going to just throw it straight out into the audience here so that we can have some of that discussion. There's obviously a lot here around communication, managing and understanding data, uh, the use of the software, also the legal side of things. Does anyone have any questions they want to pose to the panelists? A room full of journalists and no questions, come on. Yeah, here the front.
I don't think that's on. No. Hi. Um, my question is: I rep represent a smaller outlet in, in 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 Denmark, and it's 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 notable, of course, that that both your projects are with the very very big uh, companies from from the different countries, uh, which is sort of frustrating because I think some of the smaller and maybe younger companies are, are actually sort of like better at collaborating and more interested, like less interested in exclusivity, and just would basically um, have a better mindset around doing cross-country collaboration. But at the same time, we of course, we don't have the same impact necessarily, but then again, in this age and with social media, and, and you know, maybe maybe we could. So, what are your thought, thoughts on taking these uh, these types of tools and collaborations and using them in the new landscape with maybe other and smaller players that are actually interested in collaboration in a different way? It's a question for one specific. Maybe Ma, Ma you want to take that? Sure. Uh, I would encourage you to look at the list of partners to really. Uh, inform what you just said, because we're not just collaborating with big media organizations. Maybe we do in, in Denmark, but as I was saying, like you'll see how we're collaborating with s small uh, media organizations in other countries. So again, I mentioned the case of Peru, I mentioned the case of Venezuela, um, those are the ones that are coming to the top of my head, but we work with a lot like nonprofit centers around the world. So it's not just big media organizations. The reality is, though, that um, two things. One, in Europe, it's true that in Europe we've uh, traditionally and so far with uh, the leak investigations work with big media organizations. Uh, but again, that's not true for the rest of the world. Uh, so. I would encourage you to look at, 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 the, at the list of partners, which is public in the Panama Papers that I see at the org website. Um, and then the second thing is, um, we, as a non-for-profit, depend on impact. So we are not a publishing house ourselves, so impact is very important for us. Um, so that the reality is that we try to have this mixture between big media organizations that allow us to have impact while we foster and, and, and foster collaborations in countries that doesn't exist, foster collaborations or help investigations and investigative reporting in countries uh, that don't have that, that, um, that developed in, 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 in their countries yet. I would just say we're open to collaborating with anybody, um, and um, I think that you know, in other investigations, we've worked with other partners, like smaller partners. Um, so if you have an idea, and if you think there should be a, a, an area that that we could explore, you have a project idea, uh, again, an idea or leak or like or. Yeah, or, or or whatever. Just come to talk to us, and I'm here for the rest until Sunday. And my contact, you have my contact. But I think we're open to other possibilities of doing things, um, and we do not always work with big media organizations. I think that's why uh, I really think it's an important question because, like, at some point, if you have maybe three or four uh, global networks, maybe that's the limit that you can reach, and that's it. For a big country like Germany or uh, Denmark, you have a few, three or four big players that are independent of each other and they maybe will have the strength and the power to become part of such networks. Um, but they w would want to be, uh, to have exclusivity. And then if you have like a situation that like that in the future, you will have a situation like you have in the, um, air industry business where you have airliners doing these uh, big coalitions and that's it. Uh, you don't have uh, space for too many uh, of them. And I think that would be, that is a possibility of a trend where you have a very um, uh, centralized and sort of, um, you have, you would have a, a, a monopoly of a few players o over what investigative journalism is in, in the context of collaborations, cross-border collaborations. So I think, that is a possibility that we will see this happening. Um, and in order to sort of prevent that, I think the only way is to make available these uh, uh, ways of working, the tools uh, to be able, to, so to be available for anybody with that, without huge costs uh, or with, with uh, small costs and to, to have the flexibility to use these tools and to enhance these tools the way you want. And then you could apply uh, the same methodology with the same tools in 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 a uh, different context of networks of 
smaller investigative journalists or you do the network of the people who are not in the ICIJ or the people who are not in the IT or, you know, you do like ad hoc networks on a very specific topic. You don't need to create the huge infrastructure um, uh, that will be the intermediary of that. But I think it's, it's both um, a problem of uh, these tools to exist and uh, then it's a problem who pays for the time of the people involved in this if they come from smaller organizations. We do have this problem with the Romanian Center. Non-profits, it's fine, they exist, but they are non-profits that um, don't have any budget, and they're non-profits, like non-profits in the US would have uh, um, uh, an industry of fundraising, and they would have a budget of two, three, 10 million uh, a year. The time that these people uh, from different countries put in, in, in a cross-border uh, investigation, for some it's paid, for some it's unpaid uh, work. So that's an issue, I think. Stefan, uh, I'm getting the universal hand signal for get off the stage here. Um, and our wonderful friends at Perugia, we're going uh, to listen to them because they're very nice to us. So um, I'd like to ask the audience to give a round of applause to our two wonderful panelists, please. Thanks both. that we could expose this unjust system, which is the offshore economy, to the public. This source, John Doe, John Doe, for those of you who are not native English speakers, is just a random name for anybody. Um, John Doe uh, contacted several media organizations, contacted WikiLeaks, and among those media organizations contacted a journalist at Süddeutsche Zeitung, a German newspaper based out of Munich, uh, it's pretty big in Germany, but, you know, pretty small for the rest of the world because, you know, they write in German. Uh, but, you know, he or she contacted um, this guy, Bastian Obermeier, who was at the time with his family, who was sick, taking care of his kids, taking care of his wife, and got this message saying, hello, are you interested in data? And I'm sure this is a room full of journalists. If I ask you, hello, are you interested in data? What, what would be the answer? Right? Pretty obvious. Well, not that obvious because um, some other media organizations didn't reply yes and WikiLeaks didn't reply yes. So that's the main reason why a reporter, random reporter out of Germany uh, got the um, biggest leak in journalism history to date. Of course, his response was yes. Um, and that's what led to the Panama Papers, which as you can see here in this, in this graph, compares to the previous investigations. We're not comparing in size with 
investigations afterwards, so I don't have the graphic done for com comparison in size with, uh, with, with football leagues. But as you can see, at the time was a big challenge in terms of data processing and, um, and analysis. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll be uh, getting started in a couple of minutes. We're just sorting out the presentations. Okay, okay so Mar's going to go first. Yeah, but you're going to introduce it. Sure. First. Yeah. So hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us here at the Football Leaks and Panama Papers uh, panel. Um, so Football Leaks and the Panama Papers are two journalism projects that uh, have essentially, I think anyway, redefined collaboration, especially on a European and global scale, around investigative reporting. So we're going to take the opportunity here with this chat to talk to, to two of these pioneers, two of the, the important people behind two of these great projects. We're, we're going to structure it pretty informally, and I want to make sure I leave time for everyone's questions. But um, we're going to have two presentations, and then we'll really deep dive. We're going to lift the lid on the processes, uh, on the people behind uh, some of these some of these projects. So um, first of all, I will just introduce uh, the people here to my left. So Mark Abrett is the head of uh, the Data and Research Unit at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, also known as the ICIJ, which is the organization behind the Panama Papers. And then Stefan Candea, uh, one more over to the left, is the co-founder and coordinator of uh, the European Investigative Collaborations, that's EIC. Um, and they're behind football leagues. Um, so I'm going to throw the floor over to them to basically do the in-depth stuff on their own projects, and then we're going to have a bit of a chat. So Mar's going to kick us off with uh, the Panama Papers introduction. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very small, so I hope you can see me behind this. Um, this presentation, if you want to follow it, save it, or whatever, it's, the link is there. It's a bit.ly uh, link, forward slash PP for Panama Papers, Perugia. So uh, you can reuse the slides if you want. I'm here to talk about this project that was at the time the largest leak in journalism history and the largest collaboration in journalism history. The Panama Papers, it's an investigation uh, that launched and published almost a year ago, April 3rd last year. So we are just turning one year anniversary after we published. The revolution will be digitized is what the source of the Panama Papers said. He wrote a manifesto that you can read online that said that he gave this data, he or she actually, we don't know who he or she is, um, gave this data to, to journalists so that from our parent organization for 20 years. And we are really small. People think we're like this multi-million dollar operation with hundreds of people. No, it's the people in the photo um, that is the ICIJ. Those with the circle are the people in my team. So as you can see, the people um, that working data and research, data and technology, have a high importance in uh, the, uh, the formation of the ICIJ today. Three years ago, my team did not exist. What we did was to share um, the data with more than 370 journalists in 80 countries and formed this global newsroom that looked at the data in secret for a year. As you can see from some of the logos here, we had big media organizations like Le Monde, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, in Italy, we worked with L'Espresso. But there are also small organizations from different you know, countries and developing countries, smaller organizations that are non-for-profit. So we work with a range, wide range of reporters. Mostly, we work, as a general rule, we work with one or media organization per country because the exclusivity to the data is what actually moves them to invest resources. Media organizations like The Guardian had five, 
people to say five, six people for a year fully dedicated to this. So they were motivated by, I will have the exclusivity. However, uh, what we're trying to do is more collaborations between print and television. So for example, in Spain, we worked with um, a newspaper called El Confidencial, and we worked with the television, and that worked like a good um, a duo. We're also trying experiences. Uh, I am the head of the team at the ICIJ and got tasked with this um, almost you know, a year and a half ago already. And of course, it, it meant a big challenge. But luckily, we had worked on projects based on leaks before, those some, most of those in the left. And even though they were smaller, we had actually experimented with technology enough so that we had a baseline to know where to start when, when we got this leak. Uh, this is what we were dealing with. Uh, we're dealing with a complex system, uh, information for about 40 years of a Panamanian law firm called Mossack Fonseca, uh, based out of Panama, but with offices in 40 countries in the world, and connections with clients in more than 200 countries in the world. The leak was received by Zhu Deutsche Zeitung, um, but they immediately thought that, in their own words, the most selfish thing to do was to share. Because they thought, okay, we could have four or five front pages in Germany. You know, that's going to work well with my bosses. They could probably, probably they even could have gotten a raise. But we really, they really wanted to do justice to this. And they felt that they didn't have enough knowledge about what was happening in Spain, what was happening in Brazil, what was happening in Uganda to be able to tackle this uh, um, by themselves. So they thought the most selfish thing to do is to actually distribute their responsibility among reporters all around the world. And they came to ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the media company I work for, so that we actually created this team around the world um, to work together. The ICIJ is a very small organization. We just uh, became independent. We spinned 